James Smith from Ost, who's going to start with a presentation how to not only survive but thrive in the next era of digital identity, and then we we'll go over to a panel discussion. Jamie, please, the stage is yours. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So, I'm going to spend about 15 minutes talking about the future of the digital economy, and then we're going to have a short panel. Uh, talking about adoption of identity and, and, and some of the challenges and opportunities. But first I want to talk about there's a really big hole in our digital economy. And not many people can see it. And actually, as businesses make things more digital, they're kind of making things worse. And over the next 10 or so minutes, I'm going to talk about how we identify and fix that hole and then specifically how we're going to see five really big shifts as a result of solving it. But first I'm going to talk about queuing. Nobody likes queues. Businesses hate queues. It's inefficient. It's a terrible experience. So what are we doing about it? Well, we, we give people QR codes. We get into quick accounts. We get them to identify who they are. And then they can skip the queue. They can show up, we can get more people through faster. Maybe I can even share the information I need before I show up to wherever it's that I'm And Unlike sharing a vaccine certificate online before I get to the airport, maybe I don't need to queue at all. So this is really exciting, we're making tons of progress. But think of it from the individual's perspective. I've created an account here, I've then created another account, and another, and another. And it goes on and on. So we're solving digital transformation on the business side. But we're kind of making it worse for people. What does it feel like? Well, we're getting one-time passwords, emails with PDFs, uh, having to create another account, fill out information online, tap, you know, download another app. In fact, if you're a business trying to interact with a customer, you've kind of got four things you can do. You can send them an SMS, send them an email, get them to come to another app, create an account, or get them to come to your website. And then we're just going to say, well, I've got to do this again. And who's on the website and who's it going? So it's this kind of, it's like a, a low-grade headache for people. You just can't shape it. And it feels a bit like when we start thinking about what the solutions could be, we're solving it for the business side, we're creating digital transformation, incredible new digital channels, and it's a bit like the parable of the, the eight blind men and the elephant. Hands up if you've, you've heard that before. Right? So there's eight people, they're blindfolded, they're each touching different points of the elephant, but they can't see the elephant. One of them's got the leg, they think they're holding a tree trunk. Another's got the tail, they think they've got a snake. Another individual's standing by the, the side, they think they're touching the wall. And I think it's the same with our digital economy, this digital transformation. Some people say, oh, it's about trust and transparency online. Some would say it's, oh, we need much better customer experiences and seamless, seamless interactions. Some say it's about data protection and zero knowledge proofs. All of whom are probably right, but they can't see the whole element. They can't see the whole in the middle of the digital economy that's making it worse for people. And when businesses try and diagnose what's going on, they frame it this way. Is it value or is it trust? I'll give you an example. Elon Musk, when he was announcing he was going to buy Twitter, said, hey, there's loads of fake bots out there, fake user accounts, fraud. What we need to do is authenticate every Twitter user. But what we need to do is balance that with privacy. Is that right? Like, so we're getting loads of value, but we're having to find out a lot of information about people who may not be comfortable with that. So it's this trade-off. We can get rid of the queue, create accounts, or we get a collective ton of data. And this is the way it's kind of diagnosed inside businesses. And even diagnosed if you speak to policymakers, regulators. Lock the data down. And businesses say, but what about innovation? So we've got this trade-off. And I want to argue that it's a false choice. We need to step over it. We need to have value and trust. 
The problem we have is that the thinking that got us here isn't going to get us out of the problem. We can't, with today's thinking, get us beyond this for you. And so the answer is a customer perspective. Standing on the side of the customer for the first time. But we've been drawing this picture for 20 years. And what's in the middle, really? Another platform, another business, challenging business model. We're not really putting the customer in the middle. We get uh, business models that say, hey, you're going to have to share your data and a checkbox that says, I promise not to not share your data when you don't consent to not participate. You know, it's, it's kind of uh, murky. And when we start thinking about customer tools, tools that work with me and for me, they're not doing things to me. We need to reframe what those tools do, how they work. And I kind of think of it like human requirements. So far we've been meeting business requirements, digital requirements. What do I mean by that? Well, if I think about tools I have today, this is mine. I can put what I want in it. I can share what I want from it. It's my tool. A spreadsheet, it's my tool. The business model is, it's mine. I can plan my wedding in it, I can do my own cash flow in it, I can create you know, the squash club list of people in it. It's my tool. So we need to think about seamless combinations of data. We need to think about portability of data. We need to think about control over data. And so the big reveal is fantastic. We're seeing some amazing foundational work on the customer side. Ah, we need zero knowledge proof. We need wallets, we need hubs, we need interoperability. We need data portability. These are the foundation stones, but they're not the tools themselves. So we're seeing the, the new capabilities coming together, and what I think will be a new category of tools for people. Individuals will, for the first time, be able to show up anywhere and interact more seamlessly, more privately, more verifiably, and that's going to create value for business. I'm going to build trust and value. And I think when these tools show up, they're going to be based on the many topics we're discussing in my data. Uh, the new principles, the new technical foundations. And I think we're going to see five shifts. Um, I'm going to talk through what those are and what, what, why I think they're important. Because this isn't just about, hey, we need a new tool for individuals to fill out a form. This is going to have a fundamental shift on the digital economy, on how we connect with each other, and how we connect with businesses and organizations. So, first we're going to see a market inversion, and that's a bit of a grand statement. What do I mean by that? Well, you know, for thousands of years, we thought this, the, the Earth was the middle of the universe, and all the planets and the sun's going around us. And then in the 1500s, Copernicus came along and said, nah, I think the sun's in the middle, and we go around it. And it completely transformed the way we think about how the universe works, how the Earth works, the gravity, and it changed our understanding. And I think the same thing's going to happen with customer tools. We're going to put the individual in the middle. Right now, we think business is in the middle, and all the customers orbit it. And that's why I go from place to place to place, and I have this headache. Once we put the individual in the middle, I can now bring all the businesses and features and products and services around me. I'll give you an example. Think of the end-to-end -end customer journey. As a bank, I might say the journey is, I need a mortgage, do so I have a mortgage? Or as a running shop, I might say, I need some shoes, do so I have some shoes? But the real customer journey is, I think I might start running. Or I think I need to move home. All the way through to the other end, where I've moved in and the gas doesn't work, and Bro bands, I've got to sit around for two days on a dongle. Or maybe in the running example, I'm running 10,000 uh, meters a, a week. Once you give a customer a tool to represent who they are, they can light up that whole customer journey, not just the bit the business can see. And you'll see that individuals, they're, they're speaking to three competitors. And then they pull this feature, and then they speak to a friend, and then they 
do some more research and then you pull this product in that wasn't related to this one, and so on and so on. Once we put the individual at the center with tools for them that empower them, we can see the whole customer journey. And that's going to be really powerful for businesses. Imagine being able to help that individual all the way along. Imagine what it means for advertising, what it means for customer service. So, marketing version. We're going to see an experience shift. You know, again, 100 years ago, the homemaker was in the home in the kitchen, largely spent all day in the house, cooking, cleaning, organizing, didn't get a chance to leave. And then after the war, we gave the home an appliance. We gave washing machines and dishwashers and ovens. And I could just set the washing and I had two hours on. I got freedom. I think we're going to give tools to people and it's going to free us up. Think how much time you spend logging in, resetting passwords, filling out forms. Why can't I just say, just check me in? And my tool will be able to prove who I am, receive the information I need, message in the right way. Once I have a tool for people, we're going to see an experience shift. Maybe even if I trust those tools to work for me, maybe the best customer experience is no customer experience. Third, a confidence shift. Individuals are going to go around the web knowing who they're interacting with. Businesses are going to know who they're dealing with. Governments are going to be able to interact with citizens more freely, more digitally, more seamlessly. And as we heard from Nana yesterday, uh, uh, Nina, sorry, uh, uh, from the World Wide Web Foundation, the research says that so many people aren't participating in the digital economy because they don't trust it. It's like the dark matter of the web, but we can't see what's not happening. People choose to buy something online, and they get to check out and say, no, I, I don't like what they're gathering or I don't have the information. I'm not trusting them. So basket abandonment is a huge problem for merchants. Huge problem. Because of digital trust. So if we have tools for individuals, we're going to see a shift in confidence. Value is my favorite one. If you think about the Industrial Revolution, we created machines, we gave them to businesses, they replaced animals, we built factories. Brilliant, huge productivity improvement. But the real transformation happens when we gave machines to people. Boilers, cars, Ubers. And that did two things. It created an explosion of value for people, but then it drove a ton of demand into business. The same thing's going to happen. We've given tools to business. They've got cloud, CRM, predictive analytics, AI. And on the people side, it's all pre-industrial stuff. It's manual, it's full of errors, how to go from place to place. Once we give data tools to people, we're going to see the same thing happen. There's going to be an explosion of value on the customer side. I can do new things. But I can also say, hey, my address has changed, or my credit card's changed. And I can let 37 companies know in one time. So think about it from the business side. I don't call the call center anymore and give them my blood type and inside light measurement to prove it's me to change my address. It's going to be hugely valuable. So we're going to see a value shift, and then finally we're going to have a risk shift, meaning organizations are going to value risk in a very different way. KYC, know your customer for banks, largely doesn't work. Anti-money laundering is spending millions of millions. And fraud in the financial services sector, so much of it is because I don't know who I'm paying. I don't know who's in the other end. So we're going to see risk change. We're going to see individuals more confident. We're going to say, do you know what? I know this website is fraudulent. Or I know this website can be trusted. Because I've got a tool that helps me do that. These are going to fundamentally change not just business, but how we think about digital transformation. You'd expect me to say this, wouldn't you? These are all obvious. Oh, we need interoperability, we need open standards, we need portability. But it's bigger than this. It's bigger than decentralized identity. It's bigger than the regulation. It's bigger than the past. We need to come together to decide what these tools are going to do, how they're going to behave, and we're going to have to collaborate in digital ecosystems are kind of a bit clunky today. It's going to drive a ton of new value into the digital economy based on these principles. And the thing is, businesses are going to have to decide what they want to do. 
Individuals are going to show up with these tools, and they can decide, am I going to interact with it? Am I going to trust it? Am I going to think about my own business processes to interact with it? And I think this is going to become a real strategic question for organizations. This isn't about CRM and whether we automatically capture or place cookies. This is about how businesses structure themselves, how they interact with customers. Many, are, many are going to be disrupted because they are T's and C's. The terms and conditions are going to have some weird, funky clause in it. it means I don't trust you. They're going to leave the checkbox that says we will not, definitely not, without your permission, definitely send you without your consent. They're going to think about business models that are actually doing things to customers. Keep sending spammy emails and texts. But those that engage, those that think about these new customer tools as a new customer channel, as a new way to trust and engage and collect data and provide data to, to individuals, they are going to win. I've got a working assumption that there's loads of companies have set up this new role called Chief Customer Officer. And they're kind of splashing around, is that about customer experience? Is that about data? Is that about CRM? I think Chief Customer Officer is going to be about interacting with customers in a whole new way. It's going to be about competitive advantage. As Charlie uh, spoke about yesterday from the last, we, you know, ethical businesses can be profitable businesses. This is how we're going to change the narrative. It's going to how we're going to drive a ton of new value into the digital economy, create entirely new categories of business, and most importantly, making individuals feel empowered so they can trust who they're dealing with and they can take a ton of pain away they have to do. So this is what Avast is building. We described it yesterday, digital smart agents. We work for and with people. It's going to be about data portability. It's going to be about digital identity. It's going to be about zero knowledge, minimizing data. But this is not just doing it on the customer side. This is about empowering businesses to interact in a new way, increase revenues, reduce costs, and bring compliance every moment. And we're not in this value or trust anymore. Looking forward to finding like-minded organizations and individuals to come and work with us. We're very excited about what's going to become possible over the coming months and years. And really looking forward to changing the digital economy in a way that's going to empower individuals, but also create value on both sides. Thanks very much. So now we have a panel to dig into those customer tools, but specifically digital identity, and specifically about how government, private sector, individuals, how that interplay is going to work, some of the challenges, and some of the opportunities. So we've got three of us. I think we've got the fault two so far. There we go. No worries. John's going to try this in one minute. Okay, excellent. We've got John on that. Okay, so um, this panel is going to be about 20, 25 minutes, something like that. Um, let's first start with our, our round of introductions and, and then we can kind of dig into some of the juicy questions I have for, for these gentlemen about digital economy and identity. So let, let's start on the far end. Uh, John. Thank you very much. Uh, John Bloods from Suzu, Australia, Melbourne. Um, once was a uh, space cadet, worked in space industry, but now I'm happy working with more earthy things. Uh, we are, in Suzu's sense, very, very focused on the whole digital trust the phenomena, um, working with the Australian government on things like risk certificates, uh, uh, saving South Wales and very financials, and everything. So, glad to be here. Hi, uh, so Rosa, CEO of Checks. We're building a layer one network for uh, payments, commercial models, all that kind of jazz for SSI. Uh, we started in April last year, networks have been running, and now we're kind of onto the meaty stuff. Uh, and prior to that, I was the delivery lead for the Known Traveler Digital Identity Project, which some of you may know about. So that was uh, working with the World Economic Forum and then the Dutch Economic Government to digitize passports um, for international travel. Somewhat the kind of, I guess, front runner or predecessor to the IRS Travel Pass, which is kind of going on now. Is that digital entity uh, based out of the, uh, the Netherlands, a fairly traditional <coughs> provider, I would say. 
Um, I head up the International Division of Business Development, looking after the CIS strategy and longer term um, product development and partnerships. Um, and I've been working with various national governments, entities around standards and, um, and the, sort of the future outline of, uh, of how identity systems can operate on all themselves. Brilliant. So I think I have a pretty broad range of perspectives about private, public sector standards, how organisations are responding. And, and, and I wanted to start by kind of pointing back to that picture of the customer in the middle. I've uh, been drawing that for at least a decade. Um, we've been talking about user-centric identity for quite a long time. Data stores, vaults, we've been around for quite a while. And I guess my, my, my starting point is, um, why doesn't everyone call that? Like what's, what's stopping progress from adoption? Uh, and why aren't businesses kind of calling over themselves to, to kind of help the light and everything else? But maybe John, you can want to kick off. I, I guess one of the, one of the things that struck me in the conversations I've had is that the, the phrase of customer centric, um, and other such terms, uh, has been used somewhat disingenuously in the past. There's this sort of uh, thinking that uh, in an organisation, at least, that customer centricity involves knowing as much as you possibly can about the customer so you can maximise the value you can extract from the customer rather than the value you can necessarily deliver to the customer. Um, and I think that what we represent collectively, but certainly my dad, is this thinking that actually there's another way of looking at that, that opportunity, in fact, as you were saying earlier, that you can actually increase the value proposition on all sides, taking a different view about customer centricity. Well, the first thing I think is that we haven't always used the term in the way we're using it here. Um, I guess the other thing is that the, the technologies haven't existed in the way they exist now. Um, so it's like been five, four, five years, as well as in some of the, the, the foundational standards we've got. Uh, so that they're present now. And I think the other thing is we, we shouldn't underestimate the, the degree of change we are talking about. I'm working with the government uh, bodies in, in Australia. Governments don't move quickly. I mean, they move quickly for, for COVID. That's quite surprising. But for most things, it's slow. So if the government can do something in one, two, or three years, that's surprisingly quick. Yeah, so I think we don't, we shouldn't be too kind of over ambitious about something happening in sort of a uh, VC capital kind of speed of change. This will take a bit longer than that, but it's certainly coming. Fraser, do you have a perspective on, on uh, why adoption speed is sluggish? I, I probably kind of firstly agree, certainly well, with, with both of your points, but also like, it's just been easier from a technology perspective. Like, it's definitely been longer. Like, whenever you go and speak to companies at the moment, they're like, oh, we just, everything was easier to develop around themselves. Like, that's just been the history of where the development of this organ has been. Um, I think our thesis uh, it, it checked is that actually like the incentives and the payments have been missing. Um, and that's really what we're solving for is, it came up on the uh, AI desk panel yesterday with, with Andy Tobin, who I can see in the audience, um, and there's a statement which was kind of like, there's no incentive at the moment for private industry, and until there is, there's just no, well, there is no incentive for them to get involved. And that's what we want to be solving for, is actually providing that revenue while that cost saving. Um, obviously, there's governments kind of going down their own track, but we're kind of solving more for private enterprise and saying, this kind of needs to be in there, otherwise we're just going to lose a whole swathe of industry. Nick, Nick what's, your, what's your perspective? Because you've been, you've been plugging away at digital identity for quite a while, it's certainly at the government level, right? You know, how do you feel? Is it kind of working on the government side but the private sector's not going to grasp it yet? I think there's, there's a couple of issues. So first of all, um, there is no real incentive, like, like the others already said. Um, for example, if you look at the um, standards and all the guidelines and regulatory uh, restraints there are, you don't see a very clear guidance on why institutions or organizations should be utilizing identity. And, and recently we've seen quite a shift, for example, in the UK, where they said, well, we'll have an overarching trust framework, and then there's sort of industry-specific guidances um, that, that give way more guidance to all those organizations on how to implement it. For example, if you want to have rights to work, rights to rent, thou shall, and then there's a whole set of requirements. So I think that's one fundamental thing. The other one is um, we haven't cracked the, the commercial model yet. Um, everyone's talking about user-centric, and that's all great. You, you know, I've been putting that picture up on stage for the past 10 years as well. Uh, but I don't think that anyone has ever figured out who's going to pay for what. 
And as long as organizations are waiting for governments, governments are waiting for innovation from the institutions and, and identity organizations. I mean, the identity of Ivy can talk all they want, but if no one's willing to pay for it, nothing's going to happen. And, and I suppose one of the questions I have is, 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 is that kind of tension and or collaboration between government and, and enterprises or uh, public uh, private sector. And you know, if you, if you stand back, you see loads of initiatives inside government, often orientated around kind of government access, right? Login, um, a, a reusable identifier that we can use across government departments. And kind of, am I able to use that in the private sector? to hire a car, for example, but then the private sector is solving for themselves, and often in these ecosystems, will, will provide a, an industry solution for use case X. But again, it never kind of crosses over. Do you think there's a, do you think that's okay? Do you know government and private sector should be just progressing at their own speed in their own way? Or, or do you think they should be coming together and actually that regulation and policy should be uh, bringing the two much more closely together? If, if, if you, you've got a view on the, you know, the UK as an example of articulating what it means for the private sector, if that, that's the right way forward. Yeah, I think they should come together. Um, whether that should be right now and whether that should be integrated systems, I, I don't know. don't particularly have a strong opinion about that. But government identity has a, is in a very challenging space. So first of all, in some countries you're not allowed to reuse the government ID in private sector because we have a social security number. The other one is that governments are, in many countries, not allowed to compete with private sector. So it's just competition law. And whatever they provide, the private sector can also provide, they have to charge fairly to the end user. Um, the last part, I think, is, again, around, if you put the customer in a central position, you want to give them the option whether to use private sector or public sector, issue identities, um, and they should coexist, I think. Um, because in some cases, you might want to use your government issued ID um, for anything related to government, perhaps, or uh, when you do shady stuff on the internet, you might want to use some other identity or some other alias, um, and the other way around. So we've seen examples, weirdly enough, with bank ID in the Netherlands, where people actually said, you know what, I, I don't want to use my bank ID when I submit my income taxes, because then the, the, the tax authority will know everything about me. Somewhat naive, you know, they, they know everything about you without using that ID, but um, you should have both, and depending on the use case, uh, you might want to pick either of those, and, uh, and ultimately it's also, if it's done properly, you know, the best solution will win, you give them the option. John, you're, you're working with New South Wales government at the moment on, on exactly these topics. You know, what, what do you, what's your perspective on the kind of how individuals can be empowered to have a reusable ID, but in a way that's going to work at all parts of their lives? And, and how's the government think about it? Yeah, I guess it is it's central to what we're doing in New South Wales government. So New South Wales, so New South Wales, the most popular state in Australia, has got 8 million people living there. Um, we are currently working with them on the uh, rising to and rising to business space, so the, the next phase of investment is that initial project of identity from your financial. So, uh, the rising moment of the time frame is so a one year kind of program on the basis of a lean business case that was a single digit billion dollars in, in Australian terms. Uh, our ISIS 2 and 3 will be funded under uh, a, a digital restart fund, which is tens of millions of dollars per year. So, not, they're not huge numbers, but they're relatively chunky. Um, when we were doing the business case with them, we were looking at how we might measure the use cases they're thinking of. So, if they issue a fishing license or a driving license or a working children check, which is a limited person's check for, for teachers and others, um, if they issue these things, what might be the business benefits, the, the social and economic benefits of doing this? Not just the reduced cost to government, but what might be the sort of civil and economic value of acquisition of doing these things. We created a, a kind of matrix of, of how you might measure them. We, would, we had about sort of 300 use cases in our plan site called filter and then scoring up in this kind of prioritization. Right? And the filter we applied is pertinent to this conversation. We were trying to encourage them to think in terms of things that they should do and things they and not things they shouldn't do. But is this the remit of government to do this thing? They wanted, for example, to provide a KYC check to banks. And we were arguing, no, what you should do for banks is provide very well sort of things that are used by banks. 
banks to do KYC checks. Those do the KYC check for banks. It's not your gift to do that. And then crossing over into the commercial home boundary. Yes, you should enable commerce in a number of different ways. Um, you shouldn't compete with commerce. It's your role as government to enable things, not to sort of prevent things from being in any way. So this was exactly the tension we had with them in constructing the, the most useful, most uh, high value in these cases to, to work with. I think it's actually a, it, it's a synergy, it's not a, it's not a complex, but that there is a genuine opportunity for government to be a force for good of commercial and social instances. Yeah, I think you, you both had a touch on that tension because we've, um, as an ex-consultant, I've had enough sales conversations and actually seen some of the work that Evelyn was doing in his previous life where private enterprise was kind of trying to take on the tech. Like, a great example is your work with uh, the FCA in the UK and Deloitte, which was, what, five or six years ago now? Yeah. So that was a bank of set of, I think it was, it was Barclay I think, at the time looking to use uh, reusable KYC. And the thing that was preventing them was uh, effectively regulation, the fact that you, you still had to do that check. And it's kind of the same thing if you're buying tobacco, alcohol, or gambling, is you still, um, the actual identity laws in the UK still say that you need to check the hologram on, on the driving license. So you're still tied to a physical um, document. Um, and I think some of the tension is going in that Private enterprise has been looking at this and going, we'd love to go down this route. But two things have stopped them. One is that kind of regulation that says that you still need a physical check or you need to do a check every single time. But I think they've all been kind of acutely aware that they don't want to be creating, like you're saying, reusable KYC of what some people call like anchor credentials, where they're high trust, they are likely to be issued by the government. And I think the bit that's been holding everyone back is private enterprise going, we really don't want to be creating those things because we know that we're going to be cut out of the market inside two to three years. And I think that's where someone is waiting for government to come around to just provide that anchor credential and everything will suddenly come off the back of that thing. Personally, I'd, I'd like to use maybe the, 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 the few minutes left to, to really dig into like the next 12 months, right? You know, the, the title of this was driving explosive growth of digital identities uh, in, in the EU. And we've heard a bit about regulation being around, we've heard a bit about use case specific, you know, is it K1C, is it an attribute I need for over 18 or over 21? But, you know, if there, was, if there was one thing you could unlock to say, you know, this is going to drive consumers just to go and get this thing because they're going to reuse it. You know, what, what is the one thing that each of you would pick if, if you're going to you know, uh, empower individuals with these new tools, put the individual in the middle as we've been talking about. Um, what's one thing you do in the next 12 months to, to make that happen? Maybe, maybe we'll start with you. Thanks. <laughs> um, I think um, yeah, we, we need to break the, the waiting pattern. So everyone's now waiting for governments and the IBAs and the wallets and, and for, for governments to fix it, right? Governments will fund all the identities, governments will give everyone a qualified electronic signature. Um, yeah, in, in maybe 10 years time. Um, so we need to find a way to sort of speed up that mechanism. I think one of the few things that UK government has done really well is around those standards. So to get clear guidance for industry, for, for companies, and also for government on how to implement digital identity and can also allow to do it, stimulate to do, giving an incentive. Is it? I think kind of following up on what Vic was saying, kind of, I, I agree with you, but also I think about it in a slightly different way. So like breaking that link between needing a high trust credential to go and do anything else. I've made tons of stuff that could be fixed right now that just doesn't need that anchor credential. Uh, one of the things that we're looking at, because we kind of really heavily related to like the crypto realm where scamming is terrible and like ripe um, is just people attesting that they know each other and that they've worked before, together before. Um, a great example of what keeps on happening to, to ourselves and companies like us is we're approached by uh, BD reps or people representing exchanges, custodians, that kind of stuff, saying, oh, I, I can do this, you just need to deposit X, Y, Z, or they're presenting even to be members of our own team and speaking profiles and just an ability to layer in. So really easy, just some trust there would be massive. 
Um, and it requires no actual credentials, government intervention whatsoever. It just requires a bunch of people to say, I trust you. Yeah. And just build that reputation from that. So I think, yeah, breaking that, for me, it's breaking that link of we need to wait for this anchor credential before we can go into anything else. John? It's, it's a really difficult question, Jeffrey. I, I was thinking before we started this, this panel of uh, uh, the old analogy about a, a blind pen and an elephant, where it has a different understanding of what problem is. You know, it has a nice play on the idea there's an elephant in the room anyway. Um, but, uh, and this is a problem I think that has many dimensions, so a singular solution to a complex problem is always going to be a little bit wrong. Um, I, I guess from my personal experience, we had years of kind of waiting in Australia, not much happening, and it recently become much, much more active in one instance in the state of New South Wales, led by one particularly energetic uh, minister, which is on Manolo. Um, and I think that's probably where I go to. I go to this, uh, this idea that comes out of a 2002 wide article of Nicholas Negroponte right around um, lily pads. So the idea he expressed at the time is to do with Wi-Fi and 3G as it was then for mobile communications, that he saw a future where Wi-Fi or Wi-Fi networks would extend out and reach each other and eventually there's a tune to just open one Wi-Fi network to another network and to use what was then a very slow 3G network. And I think there's a few lessons for us in that, that if we expand out through the lily pad analogy, so New South Wales might be the first state in Australia and it extends out to Victoria, Victoria and so on. We can see a rolling log having everybody at once agree. That's tough. Yeah, getting everybody on board all at the same time is extraordinary. It's like, may not, never really happen. So I'm quite happy with the lily pad growth rather than the whole common growth. Do you have views on the private sector approach to those lily pads? Do they just solve it for themselves, whether it's individual reputation or use case specific? So, so if we sort of stretch the lily pad analogy, yeah, yes, indeed. Uh, uh, the, the, the advantage to government's many one of them is it can be the issuer and consumer of its own credentials. So there are reasons that the government might have to issue credentials and have to both consume them. The same can be true for a private enterprise. So we all know the use cases like so universities doing the Australia has universities that are very large size, 90,000 students, like that. So crazy size, which means there are a lot of little ecosystems they can issue things, save money, you consume them, provide a student card, telecom, and so on. So I think yes, private enterprises at this uh, role, institutions, organizations can do themselves in any case. But I don't think any one solution provider, none that I've met so far, I don't want to do one like this, does the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah, I kind of like the fact this is a community of people working in you know, solving very, very well in particular part of this problem. There's de definitely you know, a, a view we take in the last is let's go and solve real problems for people, you know, and real problems for business. Again, Charlie used the phrase yesterday, let's meet the market where it's at. You know, we can pontificate on regulations, we can wait for EI dance to produce an anchor credential. If we solve real problems for people and real problems for organizations, I think that's that in itself creates a pool for demand on whether it's peer to peer reputation or it's an identity for a specific use case. I think we'll start to see adoption in those pockets and then there'll be this magic moment when if we design it correctly, we'll see the reuse of it. We'll be able to see it traverse, move across to a different use case, a different place, but we get, we get designed for it. My point about human requirements, not just the kind of business requirements of working inside my box. So I'm just gonna, you know, wrapping up, you know, there's a bit about use case and enforcing value. There's a bit about um, not waiting for government to have the final answer. There's a bit about uh, government setting the context and environment and trying to remove some of the barriers and not overreach but also you know, focusing on value. Well, look, thank you so much for your, uh, for your time. Um, I'm gonna just open up, see if there's any other questions or comments from, from the audience before we close. No? We're good? All right, well, thank you so much, everyone. It's been uh, a real pleasure being here at my meeting on Sunday 22, so thank you very much.